It was one of the best kept secrets of the Cold War. The central command post of the East German Navy, tucked away in the depths of a forest, completely invisible from above and impossible to locate. Its nerve center was a nuclear bunker, protected by a two meter high electric fence. After the fall of the Berlin Wall, it was sealed in concrete. But now, after nearly 20 years, Klaus Funke has opened it up again. This is the first of four doors to the bunker. It's a pressurized door. The second is sealed to prevent gas getting in. Then there's another one that's pressurized, then a second one that's sealed to stop gas entering. And then you've reached the bunker. In the event of an attack from the west, the task of the 300 men stationed here was to organize a counterattack using biological, chemical, or nuclear weapons. Before entering the bunker, people would be decontaminated in a specially designed shower. Tests would then be carried out in an adjacent laboratory for any dangerous residue. Only then could they be admitted to the actual bunker by the guard. Central Command is where the Navy's top brass would have issued orders in an emergency. But in actual fact, the overriding authority was Big Brother, the Soviet Union. People still wouldn't have been able to survive, even in this bunker. After 14 days, the oxygen would have run out. The diesel motors would have stopped running because the fuel would have run out. There was no way anyone could have survived for long in the bunker. The dispatch room. This is where it would have first become apparent that time was running out. The 30,000 liters of diesel fuel stored here to power the generators wouldn't have lasted long. The ventilation and air conditioning system would have stopped functioning. There would have been no more fresh air anywhere in the bunker. As oxygen ran out, the bunker would have become a tomb for the commanding officers and their troops. Klaus Funke is not a historian. He's only leasing the bunker. <coughs> in order to stop anyone stealing anything, he's sleeping in a container on the grounds. For three months, he's allowing visitors in. One of the first to arrive was Steffen Reichelt. Hello, Klaus. Grüß Hello, dich. Steffen. Reichelt used to be in charge of the bunker's data center. He shows us around his former workplace. It's pretty strange to be here, here in the same place I stood 20 years ago, and to see how everything that we installed and maintained has been dismantled. The floor throughout most of the bunker could move in order to absorb the shock waves from explosions. Reichelt knew that he would have had to leave his family outside in the event of an emergency he wouldn't necessarily have survived himself either. In general, we just repressed those thoughts. It wouldn't have done any good even if we had survived. There would have been nothing left to return to. So what was the point? It was meaningless. The whole thing was pointless, the whole idea we were pursuing. In the nearby village, locals did their best to ignore the bunker in the forest. Even today, it's hard to locate this sinister relic of the Cold War. We used to come here to pick mushrooms. Then one day we couldn't do that anymore because they'd built the bunker. I said to my husband, who knows what's going on down there? No one had a clue what was inside. Everyone just accepted things. That's the way it was. We couldn't have changed anything anyway. We didn't give it any thought. That was the best way to cope. A core team kept the bunker ready for action 24 hours a day. East Germany marked the front line of the Cold War. The bunker wasn't built to keep East Germans alive, but to make sure their adversaries would die with them. <laughs> 